Next up, we've got Hunter Moyer. He is the program supervisor for dairy services under VDAX. So thank you, Hunter. I appreciate you being with us today. Take it oh, away. Appreciate it. You can hear me and see me? Yes, we're good. All right. Yeah, so um, I'm Hunter Moyer. I'm the VDAX Dairy Services Program Supervisor. I'm going to give you a program overview today and uh, tell you how we keep your dairy utterly safe. Uh, first off, I want to give credit to our team of inspectors. Some of them are incredible photographers, uh, and every last one of these pictures is either taken on a farm in Virginia of Virginia produced products or of our field inspectors performing their duties. Uh, this beautiful picture was taken down in Tazewell County. So who are we? Um, well, we're, we're a team for sure. Uh, I'm the program supervisor. I oversee the program as a whole. Uh, act as a liaison between outside agencies such as the Virginia Department of Health, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, milk marketing cooperatives, and other industry organizations. I also work to update rules and regulations. I explain interpretations of those rules and regulations and also tend to administrative tasks such as our program's budget. Um, we have an assistant program supervisor. He's essentially my right-hand man. He oversees all the inspector activities, both remotely and in the field also assists with rules interpretation and takes the lead on label reviews. We have a program support tech who is the backbone of our program. Uh, her primary function is data entry, permit issuance, and ensuring that sample results as well as any enforcement notifications are mailed in the timely fashion to producers and manufacturers. Uh, last but certainly not least, we have nine dairy inspectors that serve as the eyes and ears for the industry within the Commonwealth. Uh, they complete the inspections, they uh, perform sample collections, and ultimately they enforce the dairy laws and the regulations, not only to maintain compliance, but more importantly, to ensure safe and wholesome dairy products for all of our consumers. Uh, where are we? This you know, obviously is a map of the state. You can see some of us have fairly large territories. Uh, these are each inspectors, uh, with the exception of one. And you'll see that Mr. I has half of a county. And that is because over half of our farms are within uh, Rockingham County and the area surrounding it. Uh, you'll notice most of our farms kind of go up and down of the Blue Ridge Mountains, which is interesting because most of our cheese butter and ice cream facilities are actually on the eastern part of the state with the exception of Charlottesville. You'll also see uh, our regional animal health labs. These are the labs that we take our product samples to and they'll run them uh, for, for the multitude of tests that we require for our dairy testing. And then of course our VDAX Richmond office. This is some Virginia specific dairy facts uh, based off of some 2021 USDA data. I would say the vast majority of this is still accurate and relevant. We, of course, we don't have 421 dairy farms anymore. Uh, I'll give you the current number a little bit later, but the top five milk producing counties uh, were and still are Rockingham, Pennsylvania, Augusta, Franklin, and Washington counties. Uh, we've got about 73,000 cows in the state, each of which is producing about 7.7 .7 gallons of milk per day. Um, nationally, Virginia is about 24th in milk production and the number of cows, and 14th in the number of licensed dairy operations. Also, 90% of the milk produced in Virginia was used and consumed in the form of fluid milk. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Our average herd size is about 173 milking cows. Uh, our herd sizes, and then just across the board, range anywhere from like 10 to 2,000. Um, so what do we do? <clears throat> well, by far, you know, we are a regulatory program. Uh, by far, the biggest part of our program is inspection and sampling. When issues arise with inspections and sampling, such as repeat physical violations or repeated violative product samples, we do enforce the rules and regulations we have in place to once again provide a safe and wholesome product to the consumer. To help mitigate these enforcement penalties, though, we provide equipment and label reviews as well as consultations. Now our consultations include basically all things dairy related from what type of bidding to use for your animals, uh, to what type of steel should be used for pipelines and the specifications of how that metal should be welded. Uh, we help determine the best type of chemicals to use for cleaning and sanitizing your facility. We also help troubleshoot quality problems in raw milk or finished products. Part of our mission is also to promote and foster the dairy industry here within the Commonwealth. And we try to do that in whatever we do. We also educate about the industry everywhere we go. And here you can see one of our inspectors is teaching a group of children about some of the sampling we do for not only milk, but also water supply systems. 
So milk and dairy products are some of the most highly regulated uh, and safest foods in the nation. You'll see my little disclaimer there, raw milk for human consumption is not included in, in that little factoid. Um, but really, a lot of people will say that, you know, as far as things that are consumed, dairy regulations are right underneath that of basically pharmaceutical companies. Um, I'm sure that everyone here has heard that milk is one of nature's most perfect foods. It absolutely is. It is extremely nutritional, not only for humans, but also, unfortunately, for bad bugs such as listeria. Um, you will see that Virginia has five dairy-related regulations. They include the grade A regulations, the cooling, storing, sampling, and transporting of milk regulations, regulations revolving around ice cream and frozen dessert. Uh, we have pay-purpose laboratory regulations. And finally, we have the regulations governing milk for manufacturing purposes. Uh, that is the regulation that includes all of our rules for cheese and butter, uh, not only farms and facilities. Both our grade A and cooling and storing regulations have incorporated the 2017 grade A pasteurized milk ordinance into them. Uh, we refer to it as the PMO. The PMO is a set of minimum standards and requirements that are established by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and that regulates not only the production and the processing of grade A milk and milk products, but also the packaging of those products. Uh, the PMO lays out what to look for in inspections and how often to do them, how to test and verify pasteurization equipment, and establishes raw and finished product sampling frequencies, as well as minimum quality standards. Many of the standards that we use in dairy, especially when it comes to equipment design and cleanability, are also some of the same standards that many pharmaceutical drug manufacturing companies use. So the first step on our journey today is gonna to be where it all starts, at the farm level. Um, we have currently have 373 grade A farms in the state of Virginia. Those are all gonna be cows with the exception of one grade A goat farm. And we have 15 manufactured grade farms. Uh, and 13 of which are goat farms, uh, slightly, slightly different in, in what's considered a grade A and manufactured grade, slightly different rules. Uh, basically, manufactured grades are going to be most of your cheese producers. Um, the um, grade A is your typical dairy that produces milk that's going to be pasteurized and bottled. Uh, you know, ma manufactured grades, they're going to be our producer processors where the milk is collected and made into cheese or ice cream products right there at the farm. Additionally, grade A raw milk can be transported across state lines and to be used for any type of dairy product, whereas manufactured grade raw milk can only cross state lines if it's to be used for manufactured grade dairy product. So manufactured grade milk can't be turned into like a grade A bottled milk that you would buy at the store. Um, our inspections, you know, we do twice at minimum of twice per year, 83 point inspection each time. They include the construction and cleanliness of the milking parlor, milking equipment and the milk house. We also observe the cleanliness of the animals and their housing environment. We make sure that hand washing and toilet facilities are in working order. We check the surroundings of the farm and the milk house to make sure there's no harborages for rodents or flies. And we also wanna make sure that milk has adequate protection from contamination. On a physical level, we make sure that there's no hay or sawdust uh, floating around in the milk. Biological level, we're making sure that filters are in place for mastitis or any other debris that may uh, happen to come off of an animal's teeth during the milking process. We make sure that's not getting sent into the milk tank. And on a physical, uh, chemical level, we, we're looking for things like making sure that there's a physical break from any chemical connections that are needed for cleaning while milking is in progress. We sample water every two years for private wells. And every four out of six months, we sample uh, raw milk supplies for somatic cell counts and standard plate counts, as well as for antibiotic residues. Somatic cells are nothing more than white blood cells, and they give us an understanding of the general health of the herd or the animal. And the standard plate count is a way of counting the amount of bacteria found in the sample. This is most often an indicator of how well uh, the milking system is cleaned. Um, most states simply follow the federal PMO standards for somatic cells and standard plate count. And you can see those standards listed on your screen. But a few years ago, our Virginia State Dairymen's Association decided that our grade A farmers should prove to the nation as well as the world how good of a product they can produce. So they put in a petition for rulemaking with VDAX to help achieve that. And as you can see, Virginia's quality standards are now much stricter than the federal limits. And we now produce some of the highest quality grade A milk in the nation. Uh, our somatic cell count limit was cut by 250,000 and the limit for standard plate count was halved. All right, moving on to antibiotics. Cows and other dairy animals are given antibiotics for the same reason that people are, uh, such as to help fight off an infection or to save a life. However, for multiple reasons, we don't want any type of antibiotics in our food supply chain. 
Uh, you've got the potential of causing harm to individuals who are allergic to certain antibiotics. And across the board, the dairy industry has always wanted to help mitigate antimicrobial resistance. So raw milk has been officially screened for antibiotics for, for decades now. And each year, the amount of milk that tests positive for antibiotics declines. As of last year's study, only six one hundredths of 1% of the total raw milk supply in the nation was found to contain antibiotic residues. Now, the important thing is none of that milk ever enters the human uh, food supply. As a matter of fact, it is mandatory that all milk must be tested for antibiotics prior to pasteurization, and any milk that tests positive has to be disposed of so that it will not come back into the human food supply. Um, not to mention, the farmer who is implicated for that adulteration, he has to pay all the other farmers that his milk was commingled with on the tanker load. And a tanker load of milk can be between five and 8,000 gallons. For somatic cell count and standard plate count, we have a three strike system for enforcement. Uh, if two of your last four samples are violative, we issue you a letter of warning. If three of the last five are over the limit, your permit is then suspended and you can't sell any more milk until your counts are back under the legal standard. If your milk tests positive for antibiotics, however, your permit is immediately suspended and you can't, you have to dump everything you produce until your supply tests negative again. Uh, lastly, we also test for radiological compounds uh, for farms that are within a certain radius around nuclear power plants. We can also test for aflatoxins and we can also screen for brucellosis and tuberculosis. Um, this photo, it just got sent to me about a week ago. Uh, of inspector sent this to me while he was conducting a farm inspection. As you can see, this producer kept about every inspection he ever had on file. If you read it, I, I want you to notice a few things. First off, the producer was suspended the day after his sample was taken from the inspector because it was adulterated with antibiotic residues. Uh, now we have technology that can detect residues in about 15 minutes. But in 1974, a 24-hour turnaround was absolutely incredible. Also, I want to note the time the inspector went out to serve the suspension notice, which was 930 at night. Uh, we take these types of residues extremely seriously, and we always have. And lastly, you will see that the farmer had to dump all the milk that was produced from the time that the sample was collected and submitted to the lab, which was about 300 gallon jugs worth once you do the math. Since antibiotic residues cause an immediate permit suspension, all that milk that was produced after that sample was collected was basically produced without a permit and therefore unsaleable. So the producer is going to have to continue to lose milk until his sample came back as negative for antibiotic residues. So that's why you know, the penalties are so big for these farmers. The antibiotics are hardly ever used on animals anymore, and it's really just mostly to save a life. Um, but now while we're here, I also want you to notice the big bold statement that are listed above the violations on this inspection sheet. And it reads, contact your inspector prior to installing equipment or altering construction of facilities. Um, I'll get to why that's so important a little bit later when we talk about consultations. So how does milk get off the farm? Um, with the exception of our producer processors, most milk in Virginia is gonna be sold through a, what we call a milk marketing cooperative in order to achieve the best price for a farmer's milk. So the co-op decides which plant to send the milk to and who's gonna pick up the milk at the farm. And that way the farmer can focus on his farm and his herd and all the other things he has to do to run a successful operation. Now, before the milk ever leaves the farm, a sample must be taken from each bulk milk tank. Uh, this sample will be used to check the quality and the temperature of the milk and to make sure there are no antibiotic residues once it arrives at the plant. Haulers are evaluated on their pickup and sampling procedures to make sure that they don't contaminate the milk. Uh, part of their evaluation includes ensuring proper hand washing, ooh, ensuring proper hand washing, uh, proper sampling technique, proper uh, sanitizing of any dippers, valves, or other pieces of equipment that are going to be used to collect the sample proper labeling of the sample and proper storage of the sample during transport from the farm to the plant and or laboratory. Um, since milk is such a perfect food, once again, for any organism, milk in bulk milk tanks must be agitated consistently and refrigerated immediately to prevent any unwanted bacterial growth. Uh, these bulk milk tanks are equipped with multiple ways of assuring that the milk is rapidly cooled from the 100 degrees plus that it's leaving the animal from 
to below 40 degrees within a matter of just a few hours and then held there until it's taken off the farm. We've got about 230 hauler samplers here that are permitted within the state. They're evaluated every year and a half. It's a 50 point evaluation. And every, th these haulers take what we call a representative sample out of that bulk milk tank. So they're taking just a few ounces of milk in that tank that's supposed to represent everything. So if they don't agitate the milk correctly and, and the somatic cells rise to the top, or if they don't wash their hands, or if they don't sanitize their dipper, that sample is not gonna be representative anymore which means the farmer could potentially pay a, take a big ding on his paycheck for something that wasn't his fault. So that's why uh, we, we try really, really hard to train these guys really, really good because they do directly impact what the farmer gets paid. So since that producer must maintain that milk to below 40 degrees at the farm, we still need to make sure that it stays that cold all the way to the plant. So after that hauler is done sampling, uh, the milk is going to be pumped into a specially designed milk transport tanker that's designed to keep this milk cold for prolonged periods of time uh, from transit from farm to plant. So some of the things we look at during inspections of these tankers include proper tamper-proof seals to protect the milk from contamination or intentional adulteration, and you can see one of those in the top left. Uh, we check for uh, properly filled out shipping manifests, properly filled out sample vials, we also look at the exterior and the interior condition of that tank shell and the inner liner and make sure that uh, any and all filters, O-rings, gaskets, sanitizer containers, anything that's going to potentially come into contact with the milk is also properly protected from contamination and clean and sanitized properly. We've got 88 tankers in the state. We inspect them once a year. It's 33 points, uh, things that we look at on the tanker. We also have two wash stations. These are uh, dedicated facilities that are not located at a milk processing plant, but they're a standalone facility and their sole purpose in life is to wash dairy tankers. And we have one transfer station, which is a place where smaller tankers will come and offload into a bigger tanker to, uh, you know, to save money logistically on transporting the, these enormous amounts of milk. Uh, these stations are inspected a minimum of every six months. So, once the milk is delivered to the plant where it's going to be pasteurized, it undergoes another series of quality checks before it's even offloaded, before you even hook a hose to the tank. Uh, first off, it's illegal for a plant to accept a load of milk if it's over 45 degrees or if it's tested positive for antibiotics. Additionally, the plant can reject loads based on their own quality standards, such as butterfat content, uh, somatic cell count, standard plate count, temperature, or cryoscope results. A, cryos a cryoscope test looks for added water in milk. Uh, milk is basically about 87% water uh, to begin with, which I, I've always thought is very interesting. Um, there's 16 grade A processing plants here in the state of Virginia. They're inspected quarterly, uh, 83 items on each inspection. Every pasteurizer they have also has to be inspected quarterly. Uh, these, these pasteurization checks look for a multitude of public health controls and test them all to make sure they're functioning correctly. Uh, they can easily take a day per pasteurizer, if not more, for some of these larger plants. If your plant is on a private well, they're getting their water sampled by us every six months. Once again, you're starting to see a pattern here. Four out of every six months, their product is gonna be sampled. But we're looking for coliform and standard plate count, looking for antibiotic residues again, and we're looking for phosphatase. Uh, phosphatase is an enzyme that is inactivated after proper time and temperature. Uh, after proper pasteurization time and temperature requirements have been met. So Virginia is what's called a split state. Every state in the nation has a dairy program in it, and it either falls within the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Health. Now, there's two split states. So it's Virginia and Massachusetts, and that's where each agency uh, shares a bit of the dairy pie here. So uh, the Virginia Department of Health oversees the grade A fluid processing plants through an MOU with VDAX. So now we've talked about fluid milk uh, and it's been pasteurized. What else can we do with it? Well, we, it, we can turn it into all sorts of things. Uh, first one I'm going to talk about is ice cream. Uh, Dairy Services inspects two different types of ice cream and frozen dessert facilities. We inspect manufacturing plants where the mix is actually made and pasteurized. And we inspect those facilities that purchase a pre-made mix, add their own inclusions and flavorings, and then wholesale that product. Um, the VDAX Food Safety Program will inspect facilities that sells their ice cream products at retail. 
We have about 36 ice cream plants here in the state of Virginia right now. They're inspected quarterly. If they're doing pasteurizing themselves, their pasteurization equipment is tested quarterly. Uh, we do a label review every time we visit these plants. Um, some of the things we look at during our inspections are gonna be equipment construction, uh, floors, walls, and ceilings, washing and sanitation procedures, uh, hand washing and toilet facilities. We're gonna always do a pasteurization record review. We're gonna always do a uh, storage record review. We're gonna look for things like rodent control plans, uh, food safety plans, perhaps. We're gonna take a sample every four of every six months. We're gonna run it for coliform and standard plate count. We're gonna run it for phosphatase if that's applicable. We also have the ability to do pathogen testing on ice cream. Uh, we can screen for salmonella, campylobacter, uh, E. coli 0157 on Listeria. And we also will do on certain products, fats and solids testing. So ice cream has a standard of identity and it's required that if you're gonna call it ice cream, it has to have a minimum of 10% fat. So if you've got a dairy product and it kind of looks like ice cream, but it's only got 9% fat, you can't call it ice cream. So you can call it whatever you want. Uh, you can call it frozen dessert or some fanciful name, but you're not gonna be able to call it ice cream. Uh, we also do non-dairy frozen desserts uh, if you're a manufacturer or wholesaler. If it bears a semblance to a dairy product and it's frozen, it more than likely will probably fall under uh, dairy services. So next up, we've got our cheese and butter manufacturers. Uh, their inspection and sampling frequencies, pretty much the same as with our ice cream plants. Once again, we're looking at equipment and facility maintenance and construction, uh, hygienic equipment design, proper washing and sanitation procedures, proper labeling on your products, you're doing pasteurization chart reviews. Uh, once again, we're making sure that you know, there's no food being consumed while processing is underway. Uh, you're operating with a safe and suitable water and boiler supply system. Um, we also, just like with our ice cream manufacturers, we, we try to assist with food safety plans if, if you need help. Um, you can see they're inspected every quarter. Same with uh, pasteurization equipment. Uh, we will do four of every six months. We will take finished products and we will run them all for pathogens. So we're looking at the same four that are prevalent in dairy. We can also do random testing for staph A and coliform. And if applicable, we'll do testing for antibiotic residues. So cheeses can be made basically one of two ways. They can be made from pasteurized milk or they can be from properly aged raw milk, uh, properly aged being at least uh, being held for minimum of 60 days at or above 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Cheeses have to follow a standard of identity if there is one or they cannot be sold as that, as, as, as that named product or standardized product. So for instance, mozzarella has a standard of identity that says it can only come from milk that's from a cow or a water buffalo. So if you're making mozzarella with goat's milk, you can't call it mozzarella. You can call it mozzarella style goat cheese. You can call it goatzarella, but you can't call it mozzarella. And the same also goes for certain aging requirements for certain standardized cheeses. If you have a cheese and the standard of identity says it has to be aged for 75 days and you only age it for 74, you can't call that, that cheese anymore. You have to come up with another term or say it's a style cheese. Uh, here in Virginia, we have something interesting and we, all, we call them small scale exemptions. Uh, if you're a small scale cheese plant, which is basically your facility is small enough that it can't process more than 50 gallons at a time, or you're aging only, then you are exempt from certain regulations. And this is in hopes to bring more small artisanal cheesemakers on board. Uh, some of these exemptions include the requirement for antibiotic residue testing, uh, dressing room, locker, and drinking water facilities for employees, requirement for concrete or asphalt driveways, an equipped laboratory, and separate rooms for different operations such as culturing, wrapping, curing, et cetera. Uh, also, there's a requirement that hoops and presses may only be made from stainless steel. So for example, we would allow more economically feasible food grade plastics to be used by a small scale producer than a large scale producer. And the reason we exempt the requirement of antibiotic testing of milk used in cheese is that cheese should not set if there are antibiotics in the milk. Uh, the antibiotics will kill or prevent the growth of bacteria needed to make the product. So you essentially won't be able to produce any cheese to begin with. Uh, to me, cheese making is, is really an art form uh, of a food that's formed by passion and love and creativity. Uh, I can, I, my opinion is I think it can be very difficult to make. It can be very time consuming and you need a lot of milk to get a little bit of cheese. <clears throat> All right, 
I'm gonna touch a bit more on some of the other things our program does. Uh, the picture on the left is a 50 plus cal rotary parlor that is currently being installed in Virginia. There is a lot of stainless steel pipeline and tons of steel, rubber, and plastic product contact surfaces. All of these have very specific requirements that must be met, which most often requires a lot of physical inspections throughout the duration of any construction project. So for something like this, we're gonna to check to see if you have sanitary welds. Uh, are they fully penetrated and properly polished? We're gonna look at the proper velocity and slugging of the CIP system. What components of your facility are cip -able and what must be taken out, manually disassembled and cleaned out of place? What are your metals made of? Do they have a 32 micro inch surface roughness average? What's your vacuum pressure looking like on your milking system? If you have any centrifugal or positive displacement pumps, are there seals leaking? If you have a pasteurizer, it is a plate and frame heat exchanger. Do you have fouling on those, those uh, plates that's gonna, the fouling is like a bacterial buildup. Um, if you have thermometers, are they at the right place? Are they recording the right temperature? Are they within the correct accuracy? For our robotic milking systems, are your robots following the correct teeth preparation protocol for each specific manufacturer? I, I know a lot of those things I just said, probably don't make much sense and that's absolutely fine. Uh, that's why we do our consultations. It's in order to help our permit holders stay in compliance with the multitude of the rules and regulations concerning dairy. Uh, there are literally thousands of pages of documents and interpretations and rules and regulations around the dairy industry. And the last thing that we want to see happen is someone to spend tens of thousands of dollars worth of money on equipment only for us to deny it because it's made of an unacceptable grade of stainless steel, like it's not 304 or 316. It's got poor uneven welds or it could be something as simple as uh, having threaded bolts within a product contact zone. Once again, for label review, uh, I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of details as I think the previous presenters have done a great job, but we're gonna make sure that the net weight statement is properly written and spaced. We verify the list of ingredients is in the correct order of descending weight making sure the name of the product is accurately described and it's within the correct font size parameters. We're gonna double check to make sure your allergens are properly listed and also look at more obscure requirements such as uh, intervening material between the ingredient list and the manufacturer or distributor information. And as I said previously, we wanna to try to promote and foster the dairy industry in whatever we do and educate about the industry everywhere we go. So if you wanna sell at a farmer's market, what do you need to do? Well, you have to be permitted by either VDAX Dairy Services or VDH if you're doing like fluid milk or another grade A product such as yogurt or sour cream. Uh, if you're not permitted by us, let's say you're out of state, you still got to be permitted and it's got to be by the other state's appropriate regulatory authority. Your permit has to be in good standing. You can't have any active recalls for products being sold at the market. And for us, if you are making a brand new product for the very first time, uh, we are going to want to sample it and we're going to ask you to hold it from sale until we get results back uh, that are negative for pathogenic growth and within other safe regulatory levels. Uh, finally, set up at the farmer's market. So what else do you need to know? Um, I think we've, we've discussed hand washing and gloves and all that stuff previously. Keep in mind, almost all dairy products are considered time temperature control for safety food. You got to hold them uh, with, under refrigeration. If you're going to take them out of refrigeration, you got to document when you took them out and you got four hours to either sell them, serve them or destroy them. Uh, same goes with your free samples. What can't you sell at a farmer's market? You cannot sell unpasteurized milk or raw milk as we call it for human consumption. Uh, not only is it illegal to sell, you run the risk of a child or elderly person getting seriously ill or potentially dying from drinking it. As a matter of fact, a recent CDC study concluded that the consumption of raw milk is at least 150 times more likely to make a person ill when compared to the consumption of pasteurized milk products. Uh, you also cannot sell any dairy products that are made without a permit. Um, I would love to read this entire slide to you, but I don't think y'all would like that. So I'll let you read it at your own leisure. Uh, you have to have a permit and to have a permit, you have to be inspected and you have to be sampled uh, by the appropriate regulatory agency, which is gonna be uh, VDAX Dairy or Virginia Department of Health. So if you're a farmer's market manager and you want to know if a vendor is permitted to sell dairy products, just reach out to us, uh, dairy services at vdax.virginia.gov. We pride ourselves on, on being fast to reply. And even if your vendor is out of state, the dairy community, 
both industry and regulatory, we're, we're very close knit. Uh, it's nothing for me to call somebody up in Pennsylvania, Maryland, they'll answer right away. And if I can add, you know, hey, is Blue Cow up in Harris, uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, are they good to sell? Yep, I'll, you know, get right back to you. Excellent, thank you, Hunter. Um, we have a couple of questions, if you can take a moment. Yeah. Does milk testing include water content? It can, uh, regulatory wise, we don't do that, but the plants, they can set up their own parameters. And yes, a lot of plants will test for water content. Okay. So herd shares, like we really thought this wasn't gonna come up. Can a person sell milk at a farmer's market when they promote herd shares? No. No. You can't, okay. you, you can't, you can't accept any goods. Uh, you can't accept anything. So the the only way we would, we don't allow herd shares to begin with. What we would tell people is, even if you want to give a sample, have them fill out a contract first. And then if they don't like the sample or whatever, just, just nullify the contract. And that'll protect you from all of our rules and regulations. Okay. Are the same standards, do the same standards apply to goat milk as cow's milk? No. Uh, goat milk, there there are different because goat milk's composition is entirely different than that of a cow's. So their quality standards for somatic cell count, a standard plate count, that that would be different. Uh, they'd be they would be higher. So for somatic cell count, I think it's one point five million. Um, standard plate count, what are we looking at? It's a hundred thousand. Okay. Um, raw milk, like we thought we'd get away without that being brought up. Um, can raw milk? Be sold at a farmer's market and can it be sold for pet consumption at a market? So can't sell raw milk. Uh, pet consumption. If it would have to be, I believe you can sell raw milk for pet consumption, but they have to be registered with the Ag Commodities Group. And I can provide that information if need be. That would be great if you would follow up with us with that resource. Um, and that can be sold at a farmer's market if it's specifically registered for pet consumption. I would assume so. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. And then vegan ice cream, do they have to go through dairy? Yes, we have plenty of uh, vegan ice cream manufacturers that we that we currently permit. So if you're wholesaling in India, yeah, you should probably come to us. Okay. And then to clarify, a 90 foot, uh, a 90 foot, a 90 goat farm in Pennsylvania that produces Shav and sells in Virginia only needs a permit from Pennsylvania and no other VDAX or VDH permits. That's correct. Uh, what, what we've done in the past is if, if a farmer's market manager tells us that they're getting this product in, we'll contact Pennsylvania, ask to make sure that it's, that it's okay for them to sell that product across state lines, make sure their permit's in good standing, and then we would have no uh, issue with it. Okay. And then not a question, but uh, well, I guess I'm asking you, we have a lot of farmer's markets that are interested in getting um, milk, uh, having Virginia dairy farmers sell at their markets. Do you have any resources or outreach from your department that we could work with you in order to um, look for dairy farmers? We have a really hard time finding dairy farmers and folks that do cheese besides goat cheese. Yeah, so we, we have a list of all of our producers. Now, the health department would maintain a list of the people that are permitted to sell or to manufacture uh, fluid milk. Um, and there's only about 16 of those in the state. Uh, only a few of those are small scale. But yeah, you, anybody can send me a request for permit holders in the cheese category or ice cream or just farmers in general. And uh, I'll, I'll treat it as a FOIA and get it back to you. Okay. So they come to you. Cool. Um, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, it's You've been a huge help today. And we hope that we can get more dairy farmers at the farmer's markets because it is sorely, sorely wanted. Um, any last questions for Hunter while we have him? Drop them in the chat. If I missed anything, I've been trying to stay on top of it, but if I missed anything, let me know. Um, I see there are a couple of other questions, new questions in the chat for VDAX and VDH. So if y'all could hop on and look at those, that would be great. And, um, you know, Hunter, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was great. So I would like to uh, say a special thanks to all of our partners. Again, the Virginia Department of Health, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Virginia Cooperative Extension, and the Family Virginia Family Nutrition Program, as well as the USDA, FMPP, Farm Credit, VSU College of Agriculture, Prince Charitable Trust, Virginia Fresh Match, and the Virginia's for Farmers Market Lovers Trail and Virginia's for Farmers Market Lovers. We thank you.